Hello everyone um, and welcome to the second event in a series of events programmed by myself and Imani Robinson called Abolition in Defense of Translation at Somerset House, um, which uh, as an offshoot of the Revolution is not a one-time event series that was initiated last year by myself, Sarah Shin and Che Kozit. Um, broadly, Renote emerged from a desire to bring together theorists, art practitioners and organisers to think through the core principles associated with abolition and reflect on the urgency of the moment. Um, as I said, this is the second event and we have two more ev in-person events um, as part of the series, one called Carceral Geographies on the 26th of September, which is happening inside Somerset House, which will include a presentation from the Carceral Time Working Group and also an anti-raids um, uh, workshop by Haringey Anti-Raids and a reading group facilitated by myself and Imani. And our last event is called Labour, Sweat and Criminality, uh, which will be a series of performances and readings um, by myself, Imani Robinson, uh, Eben Sadipo and Samara Mayanja. I'm going to pass over to Imani now, who's going to introduce Gail and also introduce uh, the conversation and give a bit of context to what we'll, we'll be talking about today. We did talk about this, this whole <laughs> muting and then saying anything. Anyway, um, I am now no longer on mute. Hello, everybody. Um, this, um, as Lola rightly said, is the second of four of our events um, as part of Abolition in Defense of Translation. Um, the first event we had um, was um, really digging into that idea and that concept of abolition as something um, that uh, deserves to be translated, or um, there's also some questions around that. Um, so we engaged um, in a wonderful conversation with Dr. Zoe Samudzi, um, June Pang, and also Dr. S. Say Smythe, um, and that's available on the Somerset House Studios website. So do go and have a look at that. Um, this is part two, Antagonistic Contradictions with Gail Lewis. Um, in this conversation, we are going to um, think very uh, kind of openly and fluidly um, using a, a chapter by Ruth Wilson Gilmore called Abolition Geography and the Problem of Innocence, uh, which was part of Futures of, of Black Radicalism, published by Verso in 2017. Um, I think there's a PDF available online if you don't want to or can't buy the book. Um, and so we're going to use it to uh, think through this idea of um, abolition in defense of translation. So in, in some part, this uh, conversation is that doing work of translating these concepts, of thinking through these concepts, of thinking through that nuance. Um, but we're also specifically thinking about these terms of abolition geography um, and, and digging deeper into the problem of innocence, which I think um, we're all very excited to get on with. Um, so the first thing I'm going to do before I introduce Gail um, is just to uh, read a few ex excerpts from the chapter so that we have a kind of grounding in Ruth Wilson Gilmore's language, um, which I think is, is really key to her scholarship um, and also to kind of um, just give us a moment to think and reflect collectively um, so that you're all um, yeah, able to have that time before we launch into conversation. So um, the first uh, the first set of, of quotes that I will share are about abolition geography. Abolition geography, the antagonistic contradiction of carceral geographies, forms an interlocking pattern across the terrain of racial capitalism. We see it. Abolition geography starts from the homely premise that freedom is a place. Indeed, the radical tradition from which abolition geography draws meaning and method goes back in time space, not in order to abolish history, but rather to find alternatives to the despairing sense that so much change in retrospect seems only ever to have been displacement and redistribution of human sacrifice. If unfinished liberation is the still to be achieved work of abolition, then at bottom, what is to be abolished isn't the past or its present ghost, but rather the process of hierarchy, dispossession and exclusion that congeal in and as group differentiated vulnerability, vulnerability to premature death. 
Um, most people will know Ruth Wilson Gilmore uh, in part because of um, her involvement in critical resistance alongside Angela Davis and many, many others. Um, and in this chapter, she does reference critical resistance um, and their defining of a term, pr the prison industrial complex. Um, she writes, 20 years ago, the abolitionist organization Critical Resistance came into being, taking as its surname beyond the prison, the prison industrial complex. The experimental purpose of the term prison industrial complex was to provoke as wide as possible a range of understandings of the socio-spatial relationships out of which mass incarceration is made by using uh, as, as, flexible, as a flexible template the military industrial complex, its whole historical geography and political economy and demography and intellectual and technical practitioners, theorists, policies, boosters and parasites, all who participated in, benefited from or were passed over uh, or disorganized by the Department of War's transformative restructuring into the Pentagon. We meant prison industrial complex or the PIC to be as conceptually expansive as our object of analysis and struggle. But I think, she says, in too many cases, its effect has been to shrivel, atrophy really, rather than to spread out the imaginative understanding of the system's apparently boundless boundary, boundary making. As a result, Researchers spend too much time either proving trivial things or beating back hostile critiques, and activists devote immense resources to fighting scandals rather than sources. Um, and yet there is a PIC. So it has occurred to me, she continues, as a remedial project to provisionally call the PIC, the prison industrial complex, by another name. One I gave to a course I developed in 1999 and taught for half a decade at Berkeley, the somewhat more generic carceral geographies. The purpose here is to renovate and make critical what abolition is all about. Indeed, abolition geography is carceral geography's antagonistic contradiction. Um, and so we have the title of, um, of this talk, um, which really is going to focus on, on abolition geography and, and, and placemaking in, in the way that Ruth Wilson Gilmore kind of speaks about it. But it's also going to speak to the, the problem of innocence. So I want to just briefly talk to the problem of innocence before I introduce Gail. Not that Gail, you need any introductions. Um, so the problem of innocence. When I say I am, I'm pretending to be Ruth Wilson Gilmore. I noted earlier that many advocates for people uh, in prison and the communities they come from have taken a perilous route. This is important, a perilous route by arguing why certain kinds of people or places suffer in special ways when it comes to criminalization or the cage. Thus, the argument goes, prisons are designed for men and are therefore bad for women. Prisons are designed for healthy young men and are therefore bad for the aged and the infirm. Prisons are designed for adults and are therefore bad for youth. Prisons separate people from their families and are therefore bad for mothers who have frontline responsibility for family cohesion and reproductive labor. Prisons are based in a rigid two gender system and are therefore bad for people who are transgender and gender nonconforming. Prisons are cages and people who didn't hurt anybody shouldn't be in cages. Now this does not exhaust the litany of who shouldn't be in prison, but what it does do is two things. First, it establishes as a hard fact that some people should be in cages and only against this desirability or inevitability might some change occur. And it does so by distinguishing degrees of innocence such that there are people inevitably who will become permanently not innocent, no matter what they do or say. The structure of feeling that shapes the innocence defense narrative is not hard to understand. After all, if criminalization is all about identifying the guilty uh, within its prevailing logic, it's reasonable to imagine the path to undoing it must be to discover the wrongly condemned. Um, and I'll end with this. Uh, she continues, human sacrifice rather than innocence is the central problem that organizes the castle geographies of the prison industrial complex. Indeed, 
for abolition to insist on innocence is to surrender politically because innocence evades a problem abolition is compelled to confront, how to diminish and remedy harm as against finding better forms of punishment. So with this, I am going to introduce Gail Lewis um, and give me one moment because my computer is being strange. Gail Lewis is a reader emerita of, is that how you say that word, emerita? Of psychosocial studies in the Department of Psychosocial Studies, School of Sciences, History and Philosophy. She joined the department in 2013 and was assistant dean between 2015 and 2017. Her political subjectivity was fashioned in the generative cauldron of black feminist and anti-imperialist activism. She is a member of was a member, is a member of Bricks and Black Women's Group and a founding member of OAD. Um, she trained as a psychodynamic psychotherapist and as a psychoanalytic psychotherapist at the Tavistock and Portman Clinic. She is a vi visiting senior scholar at the Gender Department at the London School of Economics. And you must correct me if any of this is out of date. She holds an honorary doctorate from the University of Essex, Tavistock and Portman Clinic. She has published on social policy, feminism and psychodynamics of organizations, always attending the, to the processes of racialized gendering. Um, and by way of uh, some abolitionist placemaking or some abolition geography, I just want to introduce Gail as also um, a deep thinker, uh, a kind and caring member of my community, a dear friend that I'm just so pleased to be in conversation with. You always challenge in, in such a caring and wise way. Um, and, you know, being in conversation with you is, is so generative. It's so exciting, uh, so expansive. And so I just want to actually begin there by introducing you as um, somebody that, um, yeah, is a change maker in, 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 in a very real relational way. So thank you and hello. <laughs> hello. Thank you so much for that wonderful, generous introduction. Um, I'm not sure how much is warranted, but I will reach towards what mm, too oh, radical. I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, no, I suddenly got a message saying that the stream had dropped. Yeah, yeah. so start that again. Okay. No, so uh, hello to everybody out there. Can't see you, but um feeling your presence and hoping that somehow our conversation resonates with you all out there and you continue those conversations wherever you are because that's really important um i really appreciate being invited to be in this conversation with you both thank you very much um i'm currently um in the united states uh, where i'm um a presidential fellow or something at, at yale and so I wanted to start by acknowledging that I speak from the land that was stewarded, cared for and learned from by numerous indigenous peoples and nations, including the Mahigan, the Manchap Tukit, the Pequot, the Eastern Pequot, the Skati Ko, -ko the Quinic Piak and other Algonquin speaking peoples who were dispossessed in the gestures of racial capitalism and continue to be so. This is also the land where those dispossessed were met by those who were stolen and enslaved um, and um, who fought for right here on the green. If I could turn the, if I had a window facing the green, you would see the green, New Haven green, where um, enslaved peoples fought for and practiced liberated life ways including um, those on the Amistad um, ship in, was it 1839, um, who fought for their freedom and were tried also just on the green, two trials and then got their freedom, so-called, and were, were sent to Sierra Leone rather than Liberia. And Sierra Leone, of course, was the 
place founded by the British as a place to, for, to um, dispense the once enslaved back to Africa, in a sense. Mm. I also note that I speak from being in, in an institution called Yale, established by Elihu Ye uh, Yale. He was the founder and namesake of that university and was also, he was the president of the British East India Company in Madras um, and also an owner of enslaved people. I say that, one, to pay tribute to where I speak from, but also to note the profound entanglements that go back, I mean, just in that little bit of, of a time span, the entanglements between a place called the United States and a place called Britain and the forms of incarceration and unfreedom and the gestures toward freedom that seem to be uh, central to our conversation today. We live it right now. And importantly, I think what that speaks to is the ways in which we have to, part of our work, it seems to me, is to absolutely and always denaturalize that naturalized scene called the nation state. Mm. And that links so profoundly to the questions perhaps of translation and how we work with work produced in one place in another place and I think that might be part of our conversation, but it's really, really important. We have to get rid of this naturalized unit called the nation state. It's always been entangled and those entanglements have always been in those antagonistic contradictions between unfreedom and freedom gestures, freedom life ways. Mm. So I wanted to start there. And then obviously in that, who better to go to than Ruth Wilson Gilmore? Um, I think Imani's already um, laid out for us some of the important ideas in this in this article, um, and hopefully people, if you haven't already, will go and read it. And I just wanted to sort of offer a few contributions at the beginning because those two asked me to. <laughs> I would have gone straight into a conversation, <laughs> but but really just um, just in terms of. What I think of as the vision in the piece, and some of this will be a repeat of what Imani has already spoken to, but also the method in the piece, which speaks to the thing about what do we need to denaturalize. Um, and the vision, I think, first of all, is just how it lays out so clearly the scope of the abolitionist project. And the clarity of that, of that vision seems to me comes because this is a writer who writes with an intention to help activism. This is a person who develops theory in the aim, in the service of activism. Now, I don't want to uh, kind of overstate activism because we also need time for pause for thought. And we know that pause is also a profoundly anti-capitalist gesture of self and collective. So there's something about that. But this is an activist text. It comes from an, an activist. And you can feel it in every way that the sentences are constructed, the gestures are made, the project is laid out. And in that sense, I wanted to pay tribute to it. But also, as I say, because of the, the scope of the abolitionist project, which we see it's, it's, it's um, that scope precisely because she layers it into as inseparable from the histories and dynamics and ongoing flows of racial capitalism. And that racial capitalism has, capitalism was, has always been racial and not only because of enslavement or dispossession of native peoples, but because of the ways in which those hierarchies of difference, this is Cedric Robinson, of course, have always been racialized even when it was, even when so-called, it was just in terms of the Europeans. And she locates this in terms of the ways in which money takes form and changes and the importance of that. And that's also located, then she, she says, that we need to understand the carceral as linked to a process of extraction. So it's about the production of value, but it's also about the, the process of extraction. 
And she argues that carceration itself, what is extracted from the bodies, is that of time itself, what she calls the resource of life, time itself. So to get a sense of the profundity, this is the abolitionist project. As bad and as terrible as imprisonment is for anybody, for anybody, we need to understand that as part of a wider landscape of relations, of projects, of procedures, of agendas, of elite practices that are about um, hierarchizing difference, extracting value and extracting time, as well as minerals and all the rest of it. And what's really important about that, and, and Imani's already uh, made reference to this, is that it helps us to lower it, layer it that way. It helps us to see the question of placemaking as already, Ruthie talks about this as a kind of a human propensity, but the point is it's layered into a framework that speaks to the urgency and it, it can, um, consistency of contradiction. Because placemaking, if, if she thinks of this as an assembly of different kinds of elements, including the human capacity to organize, but that placemaking can be made in the interests of capital, racial capital, like the prison, or it can be made in the gestures of abolitionist drug geographies, which are about um, other forms of liberated life ways, to use another of Ruthie's terms. So we see then that every concept that she offers that are central to her analysis are linked to two things, it seems to me. One is an insistence that our work as abolitionist practitioners, including the scholarship that goes with that, is to identify the general terms by which we may apprehend the project before us. What are the terms by which we come to understand the task? We've got to do something. Well, how do we know how to organize this? Okay. And then also to tie that in those terms into looking at their doubleness, the one side of the contradiction as a, and, and the other side of the contradiction that poses them antagonistically. And remember, an antagonistic contradiction is a unity of opposites that are about the destruction of one, you know, that are, le that are motors of change, mo they drive forward, but they also about, about abolition, in fact. So she shows through her work, she offers the, the terms, and then she works with them to show us how we might mobilize them in the service of our agenda okay. and that feels really important and then the other key issue i think that she places at least for me that spoke to me particularly was the doubleness of centralization and devolution and the ways in which devolution is partition now i i'm very aware that speaking from the United States of America into an audience based in England and perhaps other places, that for, the, for those who are in England, Britain, UK, devolution will already be freighted with ideas about nationalist movements between the four nations of the United, the United Kingdom. Okay, but this is a devolution that she's talking about that is about a, 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 a partitioning and a fragmenting that can have the consequences of fragmenting political organization. But the point is, is it, it's, a, it's a move by the state and its elites so that we both to manage, it's a, it's a strategy of management of those who are, that it would subject, but it's also about helping us to take our eye off the ball of the more larger scale coordination, that this element of, in the devolved set of practices is linked to that element in the dissolved set of practices, is linked to that element in the de devolved set of practices. Or we might say that the project against incarceration is linked fundamentally to a transformation in how gender works and how we understand gender, just as an example. We, they're not separated at all. We need to understand them together and then define what our task is in the here and now of wherever we're located. So I just 
that's, I think, important because she lays all that out. And then she offers us a method by doing this, having set up or drawn our attention to the importance of the terms we use to apprehend the world. She then says, in what Imani's already pointed us to, the shift from using the concept prison industrial complex because it's became, become no longer fit for purpose. Okay. To carceral geographies, she shows us that we need to pay attention to the very terms that we generate and not become so in love with them that we can't let them go. That we have to be able to let them go, to mourn them because they're no longer fit for the world and to do something else. And I think that's such a profound offering because it enables us to think, okay, if we wanted to follow the entanglements between say Yale, its founder, the British East India Company, all of the violences, including those of extraction out of the subcontinent that made Britain great and all of that, that traveled back into the green and all of the colleges and buildings that Yale owns in New Haven. Okay. Yale basically owns most of it and doesn't play one, pay one single cent of property tax. It doesn't pay its council tax. It doesn't, it's not even part of it. And yet the city is in need of funds because at least 26% of the population of New Haven, which is a black and brown town, lives on or below the poverty line. So think about those circuits. Think about the ongoing life of forms of unfreedom in those moments that travel into the contemporary moment of New Haven, Somerset House, Hackney, Kingston, wherever. And therefore, we need the concepts that help us and we need to let them go if, if they don't work. And then those concepts, just to repeat, need to help us to hold on to the size of a contradiction. So the carceral geographies that help us to explore and understand and identify the um, abolition geographies that are sit right inside the interstices, the spaces in which people live these liberated life ways, despite the power of racial capital and its domination. So the attention to that. And so because I'm aware of the time and we need to open up, I think that that laying out of the scope the offering of the method of analysis, all directed to the service of how can we mobilize and how can we mobilize in a way that allows us to attend to the detail, to attend to what's before us in a specific moment location, but to do that in a way that doesn't ever foreclose on the connections is an extraordinary gift that we have in our hands. And that hopefully we can you, we can show the the, the 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 strength of that gift even in the conversation it generates between us now and thoughts in everybody who's listening mind. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gail. That was beautiful as always. Um, I guess when you were talking, I was thinking um, about the central session in this text, or one of them, which is this idea that freedom is a place and that it's a place that doesn't have um, a kind of secure end. Um, and that in opposition to, you know, castle geographies, which are a con uh, this uh, terrain that's made up of all of these systems of violence that are geared towards human sacrifice that then congeal. Abolition geography is that is that question of um, finding home, right? That question of um, resistance, that question of um, trying, this ongoing method of changing consciousness and changing materiality as a result of changing consciousness. Um, and I guess I, I was wondering um, for both of you, what, how you were thinking about this process of living in, in spite of the breakdown, living in spite of, you know, the prison and its echoes. Um, yeah. And, and, and I guess what that means in relation to your understanding of like abolition as a, as a, um, concept or as also as a practice?
just Gale. thinking. Yeah. <laughs> I suppose, unless you wanted to go, Imani. Um. Well, I, there's just there's just a few lines from the from the the chapter that speak exactly to this, which I think is maybe I'll just add this into the mix. Um, abolition geography is capacious. It isn't only by, for, or about black people and specific. It's a guide to action for both understanding and rethinking how we combine our labor with each other and the earth. Abolition geography takes feeling and agency to be constitutive of no less than constrained by structure. In other words, it's a way of studying um, and of doing political organizing and of being in the world and of worlding ourselves. We will, because we do, change ourselves and the external world even under extreme constraint. Um, this is, I think, you know, the, the, the kind of chief excerpt where she's really laying it all out of like, okay, what do we do with this reality? And I think, Gail, you and I have also had conversations before of exactly that antagonistic contradiction of uh, living anyway. Um, and maybe also Lola, you, you speak about it um, you know, as living otherwise, and, and, and that's also mentioned in this chapter. So I thought I'd just add that, um, yeah, even under extreme constraint, uh, we change ourselves and the world. And I suppose what it called to mind for me was that even in the most quotidian, you know, you could not even notice it because it's so just ordinary, that... Capture is never total. Mm. I mean, the example that she uses, or one of the examples that she uses um, in the article is of uh, San Francisco prison, um, where that was segregated by the authorities, um, or apparently on racialized lines. So there was people, people of different ethnicities in different cages kind of thing. But they connected. They found a way to connect up. And inside, the carceral geography produced an abolition geography, right inside. And that thing about never being fully captured, I think is something that if now we have the lenses through which to understand that, we can make intelligible aspects of our lives when you know, knowing that we're captured, we might be captured because we have loved ones, friends, colleagues who are incarcerated. Okay, so that, and she talks about the way that it's a knock-on effect onto the bodies. But also because the, the epistemological frame of a carceral logics that's linked to racial capitalism means that all the categories through which we know ourselves would capture us. Those moments of refusal of those, or not even, re you know, they are moments of refusal, but we don't necessarily think, oh, this is a moment of refusal. We just do live otherwise. We just do it otherwise. So one of the things that I've kind of really been aware of because I'm out of London and I'm missing London is thinking just how much black and brown people have really made, transformed London, made spaces of black and brown and other, you know, racialized of color life that doesn't, can't, isn't captured in the stereotypes. The stereotypes are mobilized, especially via the police, the police and the carceral mental health services mobilized against us in those sorts of ways. But actually we live life outside of, and that that's, that understanding of how even in the everyday of so-called ordinary people's lives, there is, if you like, the, the manifestation of an abolitionist geography. Then we can, if, because we've been given the tools through the piece and other, other of Ruth's work, 
we can begin to make sense and say, ah, so this means that my struggle isn't a million miles away from those other people's struggle, or also just trying to, trying to live, you know, what we talk about is just trying to live outside of the normativities that would capture us as particular kinds of person. So I think that's also important, to, or at least that's in my head at the moment, it's one of my interests that I've been informed by, by the abolitionist work. So that now, for example, I argue, absolutely, we can no longer use gender as a category for political mobilization, a category of analysis of how power works, of course, but for political mobilization, mobilization we cannot, because it just reproduces the harms and violences of categorical capture that are linked to racial capitalism. So I don't know if that makes any sense. It's just a kind of associated flow. <laughs> No, it does. I think I think also as you were talking, I was I was thinking about how the text really gives us an expansive frame for thinking about the possibility of human life, right? This idea that people themselves can be landscapes. And um within this idea of people um as landscapes, that there, there are, are a number of things that can be done with our internal terrains, right? And and that completely does away the idea that categories capture all of us but I, but I also want to return to to the question of time as well um uh, and and hear both of your reflections on this idea that like the prison isn't just about surplus value right it, it, it is um a, an organization or a space in which like uh human inactivity is coordinated and from that time is extracted and and from the time that is extracted our ability to love and be with one another and flourish and grow so what for you is is the uh is this connect this thing about time versus um money right versus the profit motive because i think that that can help us really think about um relation and think about the importance of relation in any kind of abolitionist logic. Does that make sense? So I think um, that that part <laughs> around around time, around, um, you know, because I, I, what am I trying to say? Sometimes when we think about abolition or definitely last year in all of the popular conversations around abolition, there was um, no, not that much mention of capitalism besides uh, the kind of, I guess, sort of like, um, you know, like, like not really fleshed out version of like, oh, you know, somebody's making money off of this. Um, the people that own the prison or, you know, like money is, is, is being made, uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a profit making scheme. But this idea that actually uh, the way that Ruth Wilson Gilmore talks about money um, as always being on the move, as always being in circulation, um, rather than this kind of physical object, but this kind of, um, uh, yeah, this kind of a velocity really helped me to understand uh, that the prison is not just, uh, you know, people who are, we've decided they're doing bad things or, you know, the state has decided they are doing un, uh, bad things. And so we kind of put them away out of sight, out of mind, but there is something active in their forced inactivity, right? Um, there is something else being done that is a kind of chronopolitics, a kind of um, tapping out of these people from the circulation of capital, um, and it goes back to what you mentioned, Gail, about this kind of extraction. Um, Ruth Wilson Gilmore talks about it as the as the kind of extraction from the territories of selves, um, and it, and it really starts to shift. I think a, a very core uh, conceptual understanding of what capitalism is, um, of how it works, and of of of, of the power or the impact of removing people from that circulation of the labor market, for example, of deciding that um, this group of undesirable people will not be uh, involved in the kind of day-to-day -day, like uh, happenings of life. Um, and it really shifts the 
like it really shifted and and um ignited i think for me a lot of curiosity and a lot of uh uh I think I realized how little I knew about really what capitalism is and how it works and what my role is in it um, and how that relates to the prison, how that relates to uh, these sort of um, international, right, uh, across the border um, kinds of, yeah, re of relationships. And, I think it's it's really something that I don't even fully understand, but I'm like, this is really, really important. So as much as it is, is also uh, definitely a text that is about uh, enabling and equipping uh, activists to do things, um, to to act. It is also, uh, it also enables us to, th to think more deeply, right? Just as you said, to take that pause and to say, hold on a second, how are we organizing? On what lines are we organizing? What language are we using? Um, and how does this all relate to everything else that we've been thinking about? How does this relate to our anti-capitalist organizing? How can our understanding of castle geographies and abolition as a place um, really feed and uh, nourish our understanding of how capital works um, and, of, and of what we're to do about it. Um, because on the one hand, it's, it's entirely overwhelming and in some ways stifling, but it's also exciting. And I guess I wanted to even have this conversation to try to understand it better. Um, and of course I have the quote here that I'd love to read because it blows my mind every time I read it, but maybe I'll pass them to you guys first. Well, is it the quote on time? Is it on yes. Mm -hmm. so, so why don't you? Because I want to come okay. back yeah. on the time. Okay, so she writes, uh, we used to think that uh, in the United States, contemporary mass unfreedom, racially organized, must be a recapitulation of slavery's money-making scheme. But if these massive carceral institutions, weighted like cities, are not factories and service centers, then where's the profit, the surplus money at the end of the day? This is a Great question. <laughs> and then she answers it, today's prisons are extractive. What does that mean? It means prisons enable money to move because of the enforced inactivity of people locked in them. It means people extracted from communities and people returned to communities, but not entitled to be of them, enable the circulation of money on rapid cycles. What's extracted from the extracted is the resource of life, time. Okay, so, if we yeah, sorry, no, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> okay, then, the, then uh, the, the final thing, if we think about this dynamic through a politics of scale, understanding bodies as places, then criminalization transforms individuals into tiny territories primed for extractive activity to unfold, mm -hmm. extracting and extracting again time from the territories of selves. Mind-blowing. So, yeah, I think it is mind-blowing. I have to say it, but it's also that we want more from her on, the, on it in the piece. And maybe, I think a book is coming out, isn't it, soon called Abolition Geography? So, yeah. hopefully Absolutely. we expand it. But for me, I think how I sort of heard that, that, that whole part was, I, I suppose, again, in that sort of double register. And we think about the question of time as part of the work, the, the way capital, capitalism works. We know it's absolutely central just because of the way that la labor is organized through different modes of organization, whether that be the old Taylorist ones or the just-in-time ones more, more recently, um, or the whole service economy, um, biking and all that kind of stuff. They all have time built into them. There's a kind of staging of time when something, when commodity needs to, the commodity needs to be made and it needs to get from the producer to the, um, to the buyer and all that kind of stuff. And we know that time has also been central to the opposition to capitalist exploitation. I mean, the old, old, I don't know, late 19th century um, labor movement um, phrase, um, 
not a penny off the pay, not a minute on the day, centralised, you know, which was in sort of British working class mobilisation, centralised the question of time and everything. And that capital, we know, responds from extending time to intensifying time. It makes intensification of exploitation of the, of the production process and the labour process. So that's always, always been built in. Um, and what I think Ruthie shows to us, in a sense, by, not impl by implicitly summoning up the relationship between production and social reproduction, you know, the extraction of the incarcerated from their communities, as well as extracting from them, um, extracting them from a process of being in the time of the circuits of capital. Well, at one level, we want to be extracted from the time of the circuits of capital. But this is to, the, the incarceration, it seems to me, is, is to do it so that the importance and centrality and value of capitalist time is kind of displayed, is symbolized by the extraction of those from its circuits. It's then symbolized as how important it is. Part of the punishment is you can't be an ordinary girl or guy kind of thing. You know, you can't do it. But it's also central, that thing about extracting from families, loved ones, communities, relationships, is because their time is lived, lived to a different beat. So although social reproduction is tied to production and works to capitalist time, you know, the time when um, the household person can go to their labor or not, and then do all the labor of keeping the house going, is also capitalist time organized under capitalist dynamics, but it's for the purposes of social reproduction. So there's all of that, and that's what's extracted. And in those, in that terrain, we live normatively and non-normatively modes of relating. Mm. And it seemed to me that what, it, what we also need Ruthie to help us to think about is how time in the liberated life ways or the otherwise ways yeah. might function. She doesn't do that for us. She shows us how they're extracted and how it's tied to, indeed tied to, the exposure of the process of production of value by by the taking out of i want to say one other thing about that it's taking those persons out of but placing them into those very privatized organizations that now run the prisons manage the administrative processes etc who work to their own logics of time too mm. so the privatization of the prisons you know all the circo and all that kind of stuff that They work a nation state. They all work to a kind of time that extracts the time of living by the incarcerated. But what do we do with time for relating otherwise? The stuff that we talk about, the need for pause, the need to resist capital by taking a time out mm. that isn't the managed break time of your employer. Mm. So I think there's something, so really sum up, what I'm saying is, is she points to the ways in which time is, um, can be extracted. Part of that extraction is to extract us from the capacity to live lives of relating. Mm. Those, that relating is both, if you like, in the production process and in the pro process of social reproduction, families, communities, all that kind of stuff lays that out, links that implicitly at least to the ways in which the anti-state state has its, its organizations and procedures and, and processes run by privatized companies, transnational companies that now do the managing of the incar incarcerated and the criminal justice system and leaves as a question for us, how do we think about time in the living in freedom ways, mm. that's, that I think is not in the piece. Does that any of that? None of that makes any sense. <laughs> <laughs> it yeah. does. It does. I think also it, it it seems to me that like um, 
what what she's trying to point out or or at least what becomes clear as you read the text in that kind of extractive mode is that time under capitalism is a, is a finite resource right and in thinking about like how what time looks like or the, the structure of human life in that otherwise place in in the, towards that liberatory end i think it requires us to actually tells us use infrastructures of feelings in different ways right i think i think it's really interesting what she she when she talks about the black radical tradition and the accumulation of a kind of like liberatory drive i think that that's really crucial in reassessing um the question of how we will live right i think it's crucial in reassessing this idea that like um central to the prison or central to that extractive thing is is um, the idea that it's possible to to shorten one's life so that they sicken and so so as she says people sicken and die precisely because you take time away from them right but if time is no longer finite if time as you said Gail is no longer what you can steal back from a boss or what you can steal back from the elites or the ruling class or whatever that there becomes that there's so much more space right to to begin to to rethink and i think that that's that's the space of abolition geography right is that there's a new a new kind of um terrain for a want of a better word opens up where you begin to reassess time you, you begin to reassess human relationship um the family all of gender all of these categories that are also um uh modes of capture as you say um yeah, I think I think maybe it, it might be good for us to touch on innocence a little bit as well, because I think that um, alongside this question of time, when she talks about the problem of innocence in, in this chapter, I see it as an extension of the language of the elites, right? The language of um, the, the class warfare that, that underpins the prison. Um, and, and innocence becomes this way of justifying why people should be allowed to sicken and die in those specific places. So I wondered... Um, Imani, I know you have like lots of thoughts on this. Loads so. of thoughts. Imani has loads of thoughts on this. Yeah, but yeah. can I just say one thing? And of course, yeah. what 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 we need, what we know is, is, although we don't, we know exist, but we don't know the content of, is that all around the world, there's all sorts of ways, including like the cities we're in right now. There's all sorts of ways in which people live time differently and have completely different conceptions of time, but that exist as subordinated knowledges and as in, in terms of capital's term, as devalued. But we know that they live those lives through different kinds of time and they're available to us. The task is, is to find them, to keep the links going. So I'm not going to share all my thoughts, but I, I am just going to say that um, I, actually there, there is a bit of time for questions. So if anybody listening um, wants to put their questions in, in the chat box of whatever, oh, am I here? In, in the chat box of whatever platform they're watching this on, um, then, yeah, then they'll come through to us and we can um, have a look and, and try to fit them into the conversation. I think in terms of... Uh, the problem of innocence, I think in some ways I have a really uh, uh, robust critique of it because I work in drug policy. And drug policy, like many other kind of policy frameworks that, that Ruthie kind of touches upon in the chapter, is, uh, you know, like um, the way that not just sort of activists and organizers might say, you know, like black people are innocent, we shouldn't be killed. Uh, we shouldn't be put into prison. We shouldn't have to deal with all of these things because of our innocence. It makes it impossible for us to uh, address guilt, address harm, which is exactly what Ruthie is trying to say. But then also, it, it, you know, in drug policy, it's there's a really clear, like, advocacy uh, campaign that is, you know, decades long, as as long as the Misuse of Drugs Act and before that, which is saying, you know, like, people who use drugs shouldn't be uh, incarcerated, or people who smoke cannabis or use cannabis shouldn't be incarcerated. Um, and and in, in the doing of that, whether or not it's unfair, or whether or not um, they did anything wrong, it moves us away from addressing the reality of the prison, which is bad for everybody. The reality of the prison, which doesn't really care whether or not you're innocent. Um, and so it kind of, uh, you know, um, 
creates this like the good people and the bad people, which is precisely where I think, you know, last year in all of the kind of very popular conversations, the, 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 abol the abolition 101 conversations, you know, some of the primary concepts are around, you know, there not being this binary good and bad and how the prison kind of reinforces that and how, um, you know, the prison is kind of our only uh, uh, response to any social problem that includes somebody who is guilty and somebody who is innocent. And you you know, in, in that framework, there's not even a, a, a conversation around what harm is, why it's harmful and, and how to respond to it. And so I think, um, you know, on every level, we have to begin to unpack this binary of, of good and bad. And we also have to remember that, that you know, the state will cannibalize anything that we uh, try to adv like, like, like advocate for, especially in a poli policy context, but also as as organizers who are either taking up that that mantle, using the knowledge that that sort of non governmental organizations are producing when where when and where possible, but also their own knowledge. Um, it just is really important that we begin to have a different kind of conversation that says. Let's say we're all in the prison, innocent people, guilty people. Uh, let's do away with these terms and 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 recognize that we are producing and reproducing and engaging in a society that is producing something called the prison that is uh, enabling and and um, uh, you know the 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 architect of these carceral geographies. And actually, when we have a conversation about abolition geography, which is a place. Um, we have to include the good, the bad, the ugly, etc. Yeah. Um, and and without that, um, you know, I think there's 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 some, you know, kind of theory of change that is like, well, we get the innocent people out first, and then we can deal with the guilty people. And this is just a flawed strategy to address the problem of the prison. And so I think for, for us, you know, especially thinking through feminism, thinking about. Uh, gender and how that how that conversation those conversations are aligned um we have to move beyond uh being satisfied with most people um you know focusing purely on the victim or the person who has not caused harm because really carceral geographies carceral logics want us to believe that people are bad or that bad people can't become good mm. or that or that badness and goodness are identities mm. instead of you know moving back to this idea of of relation things that are produced mm. harm that is produced through relation and so yeah that's that's me not talking about all of my ideas <laughs> but also I, I think it's that like um Carceral geographies extend are are these interlocking systems of violence, right? That we're all implicated in. It's not that good and bad or innocent and guilty only exists in relation to the prison, right? It's like if we think about a carceral landscape, innocent guilty seeps into everything that we do, right? It seeps into prevent. It seeps into our understandings of the military. It's, it, it seeps into war. It seeps into anything the nation state does on behalf of its so-called citizens, right? And so this this idea that the prison is only a place where guilty people go or that innocence must be um, the the framework or the mark through which we, we designate who is worthy of a livable life and who isn't is flawed because the carceral geography is is everywhere right like it, it and I think that that's what I I kind of really took from the text that there is no discernible difference that every that every single person is implicated in 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 that in the landscape in the architecture um uh that uh, like enables the category criminal in the architecture linguistic and otherwise that enables the category of innocence as well She also invites this um, 
term, you know, carceral or police humanitarianism, which was also really illuminating for me because I was sort of like, there is this idea that you can, that, that without a critique of carcerality, you can be in any way humanitarian or that, that you know, um, there is a way to be just and to, to access justice whilst carcerality is still ongoing. And not only that, but that you can include carceral uh, actors, systems, uh, geographies in your justice seeking. And I think, you know, obviously, Lola, you speak about this um, in your book, in Carceral Feminism, um, talking about precisely this problem, right, of saying, actually, we're not going to get free if we go to the state, we go to carcerality in order to get us there. That mm. is a deeply flawed uh, starting point. Mm. Um, and yet, it's also extremely, uh, you know, also to get a little bit to this sort of infrastructure of feeling, which I think we can end on. Um, it's scary. Mm. It's scary to imagine a world without carcerality. And I don't want us to pretend that, you know, like, you know, we love freedom and justice and abolition and we are unafraid. No, it is absolutely terrifying to imagine a world in which all of those uh, safety nets, uh, the idea of safety that we have been... Uh, told about, mm. promised, yeah, that we, you know, we've, we've kept up our side of the story, we've remained innocent, and you have to keep up your side of the story, you have to protect us. It is terrifying in any kind of relation to think through an alternative. Mm -hmm. and, and it doesn't mean that it's not also exhilarating and thrilling, but I think it's fear is something that we also have to address when we think about these things. I think that's a really, really, really important point, um, Imani, actually, really important, because unless we can know everything that's in play that needs to be thought through and felt through and collectively we kind of move against it, um, we, we can't get anywhere. So I think that's really, I'm really glad you said that. Uh, the only other thing I would say is, is that the idea of innocence, which Bring, you know, just, it just it's another way to reinscribe hierarchies of value. You know, some are better than others. Some are more worthy than others. You know, some are more un, unjustly treated than others, and all of that. But it's also a way of reinscribing, which is linked to the fear, a kind of immo immobilization of our capacity to act in our in our collective interests differently to act otherwise because what we're all always doing and you said it i think really money is is or both of you is that we're looking to some other authority to save and rescue us or to impose our will of vengeance or whatever in stuff without actually owning that vengeance that sense of vengeance but but more more importantly you know we divest ourselves of finding the ways together to act together in other modes that can help us address the fear, but also to find other ways of responding to harm in its multiplicity. And it's that sense that feels important about the innocence thing, that we just divest ourselves of something that's vitally important to attend to, although not easy to attend to, as you point to. So I think that's the other thing about the innocent stuff. I think should we end on on talking about infrastructures of feeling um because I feel like the way that that part of the essay kind of comes towards the end and I think it's a good way or a good place into thinking about um the the importance of affect in in what we imagine for ourselves or or how we will conceive of the otherwise or how we will conceive of ways um, of being with one another outside of, you know, the grip of capitalism, outside of the grip of the ideological grip of the prison or um, policing. Um, and for me, um, 
I think when I was thinking about infrastructures of feeling, I was thinking about them as solid bases from which welding happens, from which organizing happens, from which like dialectical thinking happens or, or strategy is built, right? In, in those modes of like, quote unquote, everyday resistance or in those modes of, uh, of doing despite violence or doing despite disintegration, we accumulate not to you know use the language of capitalism whatever but we're, we're accumulating an effective change like an effective shift where we're um changing something in the process of acting in the process of thinking but we're also changing something i think about our capacity to believe that other worlds are possible and for me that's like so crucial it's not the the whole job it's not all of the work but i think that like um uh, it can't be understated how important it is um, that there is a shift internally, emotionally about our sense of, of what's possible, because that's what underpins or that's what provides the impetus for action. I think I don't know. I don't know how other people feel about the, the importance of that infrastructure of feeling and, and how it underpins an abolitionist geography, because in ways also, I think we one doesn't exist without the other. The abolition geography exists precisely because there is a capacity for feeling that's not being captured or or bound like boundaried by capitalism, by the prison, by you know these all of these ideological forces. You're thinking, Imani. I think no. I think you've said it, though, Lola. I think that that's the point that these infrastructures of feeling do this, and that they are multiple and become a matrix, really, in which we, you know, a matrix in that full sense of that that word, matrix, as as a generative motor, if you like, um, through which. And she says it, doesn't she? As a result the selection and reselection of ancestors is itself part of the radical process of finding anywhere, if not everywhere, in political practice and analytical habit, lived expressions, including opacities, of unbounded participatory openness. And that's what, you know, to be open to possibility, open to connection, to living otherwise in an ongoing sort of way is so so vital as a mode of resistance refusal um but importantly you know goes against the, the against a kind of despair against despair that i know i can feel myself in sometimes in the face of the world you know i can feel despairing and then have to be reminded by things such as this, these events, by what's going on, by all the otherwiseness that's going on. Um, and that I'm a little part of, in some senses, it's really important because despair will really do us in. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I think there's something, you know, I'm, I think we could talk about this for a long time and, and really do a close reading of, of what she's written. Um, but it's just really also uh, hitting me in, th in this conversation that um, I think sometimes we think like, oh, we need to feel more, feel, like address our feelings in order to get to abolition or in order to get to some kind of freedom as if our feelings have not been, I don't wanna say hijacked, <laughs> but we feel genuinely uh, vengeful, genuinely uh, afraid, genuinely uh, self-righteous in our ideas that are not actually our ideas, that are these carceral geographies, that are these uh, this kind of uh, mimicking of a state apparatus, of a state structure within ourselves, within our relations. And so I think it's also about kind of as much it is, as it is about listening into those feelings, it's also about really the capacity and the openness, as you're saying, the vulnerability um, and the decision to change. I think 
as much as we resist the individualization um, of uh, transformation, I think there's also a real um, attendance that we all have to do to be willing, precisely because we were never innocent, uh, to change to change how we think about ourselves, change how we think about each other, to change the ways in which we uh, feel about harm, about freedom, um, about each other, about ourselves, about our capacity. Um, and I think that that is, is you know, not a, not a challenge that can ever be taken up in isolation. Absolutely, what we're saying is this is all, uh, uh, interrelated, right? Um, but that is part of this uh, process, this wayfinding towards abolition is to to really commit to this possibility of just as outside of ourselves we want to see change, we also need to to acknowledge and admit and embrace the reality that 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 must include preclude. Uh, a change within ourselves. Um, I've certainly seen it in myself in, in relation to studying abolition, being a student of abolition. Um, I've seen it in other people. And, uh, you know, I don't think there's, there's, there's any kind of abolition scholars who would say that they haven't also seen it in the world. Um, and so I, I just want to kind of um, thank you both for the ways that you have changed me. And, um, his to changing together. <laughs> yes. <laughs> what a what a wonderful note to end on. Absolutely. Thank you so much, um, Gail, for for being so generous with your time and your thoughts and oh, for well, thank you and thinking through it with us. Honestly, um, it's been a joy, an yeah. absolute joy. Really, thank you. The thanks are all mine, and really, it's been great to be in conversation. We could just go on because you, Imani's just brought us now into yeah. Think, the psychoanalytic, and now I'm racing away <laughs> with that stuff. But with that, another conversation, we'll go off mic and do that. Yeah. We'll, we'll have to write it down. Yeah, yeah. But um, yeah, no, thank you. Thank you. And um, hopefully it, for people listening, watching, it's been generative um, for your own thinking and um, that you carry those forward. And especially points where you could say it better than us or better than me and and have more ideas and develop them because we know they're there outside beyond us three. You know, so and everyone really read, read the chapter as well. Yeah, um, yeah, please do. Yeah, 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 yeah. So thank you very much. Yeah, I don't think I don't think we can put the illegal PDF uh, on the website, yeah. but it, it is on the internet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Also, maybe Verso yeah. could send it to all of the audience members. I don't know. Yeah, that would be good. <laughs> That would be good. <laughs> um, thank you, everyone. Goodbye. Connection. Okay.